Deer Doing Deer Things. This is the Land Life Podcast with Chris Brackett. I got my friend Dougie Fresh in the house right here. He's sitting right here next to me. So I'm going to be talking to him a little bit. We are here to tell you about Deer Doing Deer Things. I have been waiting literally 365 days for this last week of October. I look forward to the full moons. So many people talk about the full moons nowadays. I'm the original full moon, full moon gangster. I love killing big deer on full moons. 24 to 48 hours before that full moon in that daylight, that monster will, that, that monster will walk in the daylight. Like that is, you know, my gospel besides Jesus Christ, my, my savior, the gospel to me is if I'm hunting a big deer, I've got two, maybe three full moons in that hunting season. And the full moon is happening this Thursday, the 28th. Um, we were supposed to have a big front. We're going to talk about that a little bit, but I want to tell you about deer doing deer things. Tell you a little bit about myself. My name is Chris Brackett. Did Fear No Evil, Aero Fliction on Outdoor Channel, Sportsman's Channel. You can follow us on Instagram. You can follow us on Facebook. Uh, you can look at the Chris Brackett Land Life pages. Follow us on there. We just did lives tonight. I mean, 28,000 people were following us tonight and watching the video of live in the field. I don't go by DeerCast. I don't go by uh, a, a simplicity of, hey, let's just follow this app for what's going on in the world of deer hunting and out in uh, the world. I believe in the fact that you can go outside. You can just kind of feel what's going on. You can look at your dates that have worked year after year. One of those things is looking at getting into Halloween. When you're getting in the last week of you know, October, and it's getting close to that November, that sweet November, you're looking at big deer starting to do kind of pre-rut things. I don't like the pre-rut and the rut and the post-rut. I believe it breaks down a lot cleaner than that. You're looking for high pressure. And if you don't know what the high pressure is, you're looking at what's called the barometer. It talks about how the sky opens up and the pressure and then one thing that I think a lot of people don't talk about is the humidity. You know, today when we went out, we actually went golfing this morning and you could just feel the the pressure was high, but you had this really kind of a um a low humidity, thin air feel, crispness that we haven't felt all year long. And I've watched the last couple of days uh where this fall, 2023 fall has really come into its own where you know that it is getting time. <laughs> I watched one of my buddies on a podcast today and he was losing his mind. I think it's nine finger, uh, nine finger podcast out of Iowa. And uh, he's right. He was just talking about killers kill and it is time to kill. And it's time to put the women and children to bed and, and go hunting. And I was just absolutely cracking up. He's a funny dude. Um, but it is true. We're, we're looking at, uh, we're looking at October 20s, right? October 20th to, to the 30th, you've got this, a.k.a. pre-rut. Deer doing deer things, hitting scrapes, bucks out cruising a little more. They're a little bit on a mission. Tonight, let's talk about tonight. Tonight was a very good hunt, but we had a south-southeast wind. Normally, if I say if there's, a, if there's an E in the prediction of what the wind is going to be. If it's coming out of the east at all, it's going to be very, very unstable. Um, but tonight, for some reason, you just kind of felt that system. You felt that crispness in the air. And the one thing I'm looking at when I'm looking at what days I'm going to hunt, the number one thing is going to be the consistency of the wind. I really don't care if that consistency is out of the north, that consistency is out of the south, west, east, but it has to be giving me a scent cone. And that means from where I'm at, behind me, I would say probably about um, a cone of probably, I don't know, 15 to 25%. This cone that, that goes behind me for a, a, a hundred yards or 200 yards. I mean, you can get really out there as far as how, how far a deer can smell you. Is it in the open? Is it in the timber? But to me, it's at least a couple hundred yards. So from where I'm hunting, where the wind's blowing, and then where that wind is going, 
for a couple hundred yards in kind of a cone if you were to light a fire. If you follow me at all on Instagram and, and Facebook, you're going to know that I light fires almost daily if I'm trying to decide if I'm going to hunt. It becomes kind of like a ritual. I go out, I light a fire in my front yard. I'm kind of on a high point. I've got fields around me. I've got a little bit of trees uh, that the wind kind of has to come through. And you're going to be able to see that wind blow that smoke. And if you've ever sat by a campfire, and most of you have, if you're sitting there, you're watching this fire. And if that fire kind of chases you, you sit down in a seat uh, around a fire, you're sitting on a stump, a chair, and that 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 smoke uh, turns and comes at you. And it doesn't matter where you sit on that on that ring of fire and that smoke chases you. That's a very unstable, non-consistent wind. And that is just not a good when to get away with fooling deer especially mature whitetails i mean going out to hunt deer that's that's not really that hard find the consistent wind find the trails that they're in how to enter without booger in the woods and then you're going to have deer come by and you'll be able to make the shot and take home a deer but when you're going after mature whitetails they're a different creature and the story from tonight is no different you know you have this fire that that you that that you can just imagine and the smoke chasing you at, you know, at, at, at camp as a child or whatever, sitting around a campfire and that smoke's chasing you around that fire. No matter where you sit, it seems like the smoke goes to you. That's an unstable wind, right? So go with that. Figure out how you can light a fire and really think about how that smoke, me, me and Dougie, uh, Dougie's sitting here behind the, the light and the camera and we were just visiting. We've actually been going to do an experiment for all y'all. Everybody at Land Life, we're going to, figure out how to get a bunch of smoke bombs and we're going to do some smoke bomb tests and kind of show it in in the alfalfa fields and in the timber and how that smoke kind of permeates and goes through uh how it gets up out on certain days and goes high pressure in and over the trees and then other times how when that air is really thick with moisture and really really thick thick and hangs in the air and it's a one to five mile an hour wind how how fast does that smoke dissipate and go through the woods? If you remember a cartoon when we were kids, you would watch Mickey Mouse cartoons and stuff, and you would have these uh, the little hand that creeps out and grabs Mickey Mouse by the nose and kind of drags you through. If you think of that and how that that scent and that smoke and everything permeates through the woods, like that's real. Like that is the most the most important thing to me is the consistent wind. So today we had a Southeast wind. We'll talk more about fire in the upcoming episodes. And, uh, but you can light one just behind your garage in your front yard, have this little place that you go to kind of just figure out if you're going to go hunting, if it's better to take the wife and the kids to, you know, a movie or dinner, or if it's right to go hunting, if you've got a five, 10 mile an hour wind blowing, consistently in one direction don't doubt it go but pay attention to that that's going to tell you the most consistent way um the most consistent wind is to watch that that little bit of smoke that little bit of fire but today it was southeast and and doug was watching it because i've really been beating it into his skull like he's kind of my guinea pig you know this is a guy that has uh, places to hunt and uh, farmland and things like that and and uh but really you know had lots of places and kind of jumped around and just had fun with hunting and i was like you just really need to get more strategic in in the way you operate in the way you invade your properties and and that's what we teach at, La at land life and game changers and we when we have our clients the number one thing is how to set up a property to where that wind never blows into that timber that wind never blows into that bedding and if i could teach all my friends one I'll light the fire in the front yard and watch it. They've, everybody's got 20 minutes to watch a fire before they go make a decision on where they're going to go hunt. And if I can get my friends to do that, then if I can take kind of the center of their hunting area, one, leave it alone for 30 to 60 days prior to the season and kind of chip away at the outside. Now you've got this consistent wind and you've got these, these, these winds blowing out south and north and you can kind of just hunt the outskirts and you're going to be able to keep those big mature deer and a lot of those does very calm in the middle of your property and if you're able to do that your the 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 reward the juice the juice worth the squeeze is the juice worth the squeeze it's so much sweeter when it's 
bigger than life. Like you get to see deer do deer things. They, they don't smell you. You can go on five or six hunts and those deer don't smell you. You get to see them do their thing and little bucks come out and hit scrapes. And when you, when you can do that over and over and you can fool t- deer 20, deer 30, deer 40, it may take you 10 hunts to fool 50 deer. But there, there, there can only be so many deer in that lot till that 51st deer will be the big mature buck that you're after. And you're going to get a shot at them. And that's the key is how long can you keep hunting this wood lot, controlling the factors of it to be able to fool 50 deer to shoot that 51st. Or maybe it's 100 or maybe it's 20. It just depends on if you're after a three-year-old, a four-year-old, five-year-old and what's in that wood lot. But if you can do that, that is truly my life's dream is to teach people to do that because not only does it help the hunter and the reward and the the kids and the generational understanding of whitetail hunting and critters uh but it really helps the neighbors it helps the whole thing because once you understand that you can really kill a whitetail at will you're not as bloodthirsty that just helps the population that just helps the bigger deer and we get onto a um you know a, a better understanding of hunting now going on to tonight this is a perfect example so here's a piece of property that i have i've hunted it for years i have this one sliver um that goes back with a big top field it's in soybeans off the edge of it that lays perfect is two clover plots that i went in and i carved out i had i I, about three years ago four years ago i put down and frost seeded um, some white gold clover rush. One of my favorites, it's got some of the biggest, whitest ladino clover with the biggest clover I've ever seen in it. it and, and, that, and that to me is what they desire. You can get into kind of uh, um, some of the, the creepy crawly clovers that they kind of plant down in the south to keep the moisture in the ground that has, you know, three to 30 times more Stalins and the Stalins are the little parts that are touching the ground and going down deep into the soil. And that's, and and that's kind of how clover grows. We're not going to get all technical into that. Just imagine this big, beautiful clover plot. I only mowed it once or twice this year. Um, sprayed it with IMOX, I-M-O-X, IMOX at like six to seven ounces per acre and just no weeds, beautiful. And these deer are in there like crazy all summer, drop it, the does are dropping their fawns on them. And this 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 thing's kind of like an hourglass. And I'm on I'm on the north side on the edge of the soybean where this clover kind of comes out. It's got some brassicas in it. It's got some gold fever in there with some brassicas and some turnips. And there's no deer in it, but there has been deer this week just 20, 30 a night coming off of these dried beans. And most of the time you're going to find these whitetails not eating the beans, but they may be walking through them. Remember, these beans are up to, you know, the bottom of their bellies, right? And so it's real good cover around the edges for them to come out, pick through, and and then bet on the, on the outsides. And then they know that nobody's, you know, driving through these standing bean fields. And so while these big deer are kind of on the edges these bigger whitetails and these buck these bucks right now are really hitting the edges of these soybean fields and so that's just what happened tonight was i was expecting the does to pile out from my left and kind of come out in front of me and and the wind was blowing from the clover to me and up over this edge and kind of just on a little bit of quarter out out to the uh the soybean field i looked out there into the soybean field kind of a little bit downwind but it was about 100 yards and there was bucks already fighting in the field and this was probably 5:30 so shooting time ended around around 6:30 probably 6:28 and these bucks were out there fighting in this field and as i started to watch them and i started to watch them fight and when i say fight they're not fighting to the death you know this is october uh, 20 something. I don't know. What is today? 25th, 24th, 23rd. So it's October 23rd right now. And these bucks are pre-rutting. They're getting into the game. Uh, this is, this is really what I wanted to talk about today was they're just getting into the game. These bucks are out there sparring. I wouldn't say they're fighting. Um, 
but they're pushing each other around. They're, they're creating a little bit of dominance right now. And I, I'm watching these two bucks. All of a sudden, the third one pops up out of nowhere. I think he comes out of the grass ditch. These three bucks are out there about 85, uh, 90 yards. And they're tickling antlers and they're fighting. And then I watch one of them snap their head up and they're looking across the field. And I know that this other side of this field, this is where I shot at the really big deer. The only other time that I hunted this field, that was October 5th. So here we are, you know, almost 20 days later. And this is only the second time I've hunted this, let's say 150 acre patch of timber and fields. And so this is the second time in. So these deer have been left alone. The crops are still in and I, they look across the field and I look at my binoculars and there is about a seven or I'm, I'm just going to say seven year old whitetail. I know he's older than five. I know he's on the downhill. He could be older than that. This is the second time I've seen this deer in the same field and he's dominating this field. And here he comes. He's at 300 yards away staring at these bucks and He's walking across the standing bean field. And I'm looking at him through binoculars, looking at him, looking at him. Here he comes. And I got to make a decision because this deer is just going to keep going. And this is the first time that I've seen deer from October 1 till now, October 23rd, really be on a mission. I've watched these bucks come out of the corn, come out of the, the CRP fields and these all these different hunts. I've hunted about six or seven times and I've watched them in my yard and I've watched them in my farm and I've seen, been able to see a lot of deer do do what they're doing and be able to tell you and be able to kind of study what they're going through. But this is the first time I've watched a deer, you know, come across the field on a mission heading 300 yards in a matter of five minutes across the field on a mission. This tells me that they are in this very dominant uh, posturing hit every scrape I can, go tell every single buck that's on the block that he's the man, these bigger deer. And these other guys, they're like, what are we doing? This is kind of my first rack, guys. Uh, do we push each other around and we're going to do a bunch of wrestling and we're going to, you know, pee on some scrapes and we're going to, what are we going to rub on these trees? And they're just kind of having fun with it. They're all the same, kind of the same age and same size. And then you've got these big dominant deer. They're just bully deer. And this deer is coming across and when I look at him through binoculars, he's got these big giant, like the size of my forearms. They, they look like uh, Kyle Schwarber's, you know, Louisville slugger bats um, that are just these big, massive um, main beams that come out. And then he's got these big forks, maybe a couple extra points on there. But I realized that this deer is over the hill. He's this big bully buck. I've seen him one time before. He came over. And he was just walking straight toward these other deer and he's going to get downwind to me. And I know he's going to know something's up. But the two-year-old don't really know something's up. And then all of a sudden I'm like, you know, why don't, why don't I just test this deer and see what mood he's in? So he's walking. The wind's blowing about six, seven miles an hour. I give him an old. <laughs> you got to get that at the end. And this buck doesn't hear me. And so I'm like, all right, one extra level of decibels. And that buck snaps his head and he kind of catches that last little bit of, and he stops and he's looking my direction. And this is where you guys need to write this down. Dougie, write this down in your, your buck Bible. Never, never. Uh, if they're looking at you, never. Don't hit your horns. Don't move. Clench your butt cheeks. Do not move if that deer is looking at you. If he is looking in your direction, that dude will pinpoint, he will pinpoint whatever and wherever you are within inches of where you are. I'm telling you right now, one day you're going to be confronted with this where you where you did a little bit of burr, burr, and he turns around and he snaps his head and he looks at you. And you're like, man, I'm just going to give him one more. And that dude will pinpoint you. He will snap his head and he will be gone. And you go, ah, shouldn't have done that. This is from your old boy right here that no longer has a dark hair on his face. He has a big old white beard like Santa Claus. I have that from wisdom, boys and girls. I have messed up more times than you can, that you can fill a pickup truck full. 
I'm telling you right now, if they're looking at you, don't call. Never. Wait till he turns his head and then give him another one. So this deer is staring my direction straight at me. And he looks back at those little bucks. Because if you just wait, he's trying to see something move. He's trying to listen and pinpoint where that came from. He, You're just praying that a squirrel snaps a limb behind you. You're praying something else makes a noise. Don't move. Don't breathe. If you get nervous, Davy Crockett grinned down a bar. Remember that. Davy Crockett, for all you young guys, he was a, he was a, uh, he was a folklore, a folklore legend. And Davy Crockett grinned down a bear. They, in Kentucky, they said bar. So Davy Crockett grinned down a bar. Now, I don't really think great Davy Crockett grinned at a, a bear and the bear died. Okay. But I do believe that Davy Crockett, to get through his fear, smiled. So one of the greatest tricks that I have up my sleeve is to, when a deer is looking at you, when a big buck is staring at you, when you're in that moment that you're starting to lose your crap a little bit, just smile. So this buck's looking at my direction. I'm smiling, going, this is a great opportunity. What a cool night. And I give him, and, 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 and so he's sitting there looking at me, and he just decides to turn and look up the field at those bucks that were fighting that are staring at him. And I just give him a real quick one. That dude, Hup Twos, starts licking his lips. He is licking his lips, man, licking that nose, trying to get that scent. And he is now quartered at me, trying to catch a little bit of my scent coming into this clover plot. And he walks for the next three minutes from 200 yards, like 150 yards, straight across these beans, straight to me, postured up. He looks like he's 400 pounds. He's all bristled up. He walks dead to the base of my tree. And I've got kind of these overhanging limbs off this, uh, I think it's a huck, uh, little mulberry tree that's that's a overgrown. It's got these all these scrapes underneath it. He starts wrecking all the scrapes, and then he'd stop, and he'd listen, and he'd listen, and he'd listen. You guys hear him, crickets. So he, he's sitting under this mulberry tree, and he's ripping up these scrapes, and he would rip them up like he would get excited about what he was doing. And, and he really didn't pee on any of the scrapes. And I'm studying this deer. This is, I mean, this is why I'm able to tell you these stories. I'm studying them. This is a seven year old. I'm going to say seven. He's probably older. He's seven and a half year old whitetail. He's at less than 10 yards. I'm watching him rip up scrapes. I'm studying him with my binoculars through the trees. Uh, I'm using, I'm using my crossbow. Okay. Boo. He's using the crossbow. Listen, I've killed enough deer that I can shoot him. I can hit him with a truck if it's legal. Okay. Leave me alone about the crossbow. All right. I'm hunting, hunting there and I'm at 10 yards. He's hitting all these scrapes and I am studying this deer with my binoculars straight down below at 10 yards, watching him hit these scrapes and he would be thrashing the tree. And all of a sudden he would just stop. It was like he was getting frenzied and he knew that if he got frenzied, whatever was in the woods or whatever would either start walking or start moving. And these are the small details, guys, that over the last, even now, 30 something years that I've picked up on. And so he would thrash this tree and then all of a sudden he would listen. And as he listened and as it, it, nothing, nothing moved, he decided to keep walking well as he walks out in the clover plot, these other deer, there's now six bucks in the standing beans. The two are over there with a third one that's 10 yards. And these other two show up on the down, the down, uh, the downside of this clover plot where it drops over. And now all of a sudden they show up. Now there's two three-year-olds, um, a, a couple two-year-olds, and then some little baby guys. And they're all deciding to square off and fight. Now, the big boy, he's still standing over me. He walks over and individually breaks up the fight and then would fight whichever one was there. And they're all just testing the dominance. Now, this bigger deer, this big forky, giant fork deer, this deer is literally, you know, establishing dominance. But at the same time, he is keeping these bigger, more mature deer off of this, let's say, 50-acre 
soybean field and the brush around it. And we've watched these bigger deer come in, this deer moves in, and these deer have been on the outskirts. So it would have been great to have, I don't know, Dougie Fresh would have been there. He would have smoked it because it's a big, big mature deer. My wife would have killed it. Um, but for me, it was like, well, I've fooled this deer twice. Both times I've been into this big flat field, I've been able to fool this deer. So for me, I know I said age before beauty, but at the same time, I only get two bucks in Illinois. I would have been kind of done. So, so just tonight, just taking in tonight, like what happened and what these deer are doing, what a great way to give you a, a good report that, what do we talk about, Doug? We talked about decoying bucks, right? Like, I mean, right now is the time that if you are not, um, you know, if you're not proliferant, uh, what do they call it? Proliferant? Proliferant? If you are not uh, well-versed in deer vocalization, this is when you guys need to to kind of study up. Go watch YouTube videos of actual deer doing it. Don't listen to crazy people like me tell you how to do it. Go listen to Bucks do it. If you're not watching them and 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 being able to memorize how the cadence is and stuff and how to grunt, um, you know, spend some time. If you guys got kids out there, I'll promise you three of them are watching YouTube right now as you're listening to this. Uh, just have them put in snort wheezes. Don't listen to the calls. Don't listen to the, you know, the 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 little plastic things or whatever. All you need to do is just be able to do a couple of things. It's more about cadence, just like ducks. You know, you're looking at a cadence where you're two, three quick. You know, if you can't do, well, we probably need to stop deer hunting, but you just need to give a little. And then uh, you're taking your top teeth and your bottom lip and putting them together and then just blow. And then you're going to put the two together. <laughs> Now, surefire way to make your wife laugh is to walk around all night long until she yells at you or throws something at you with a little. <laughs> and if you, you can get two, you can get three, you can get four, you can get five in there. I've watched deer do it in front of me to where you got to kind of think about it. These guys are all jacked up on testosterone. Their necks are giant. They're only getting to breathe and get a little get a little nasty once a year they're fighting for their lives they only live two or three or four or five or six years they're dodging cars and ripping up trees for a living like this is what they're doing and these guys are so aggressive that you got to kind of think of it like this if 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 i'm gonna if i'm gonna get aggressive to somebody i'm gonna go hey you know i'm gonna yell i'm gonna have an initial right or a, or a dog they're barking so if you're if you're thinking like that and you're thinking like a deer, that deer is no different than a dog. That deer's in a food plot with a bunch of other people eating his food, pissing on his food, uh, raking on his trees, scraping on his dirt. Why I've seen him do just a one. Like this is what you're this is what you're trying to emulate. You know you're trying to impersonate this deer and just getting pissed. You're just going, but sometimes they go. And they kind of, they, they suck in when they do it. Like, and, and, and you're, you're trying to emulate it. The fa the easiest way a human can do it is to go. And I know it sounds silly. I know you just kind of laughed and guys, okay, move on, Chris. I'm just trying to get that cadence in your brain. And if you can just figure out how to do it, it is the number one thing for a five or six year old animal that you see out in a field and he is making a scrape anywhere between right now and into a period where he's been locked down with a doe and he's, he's keeping the other bucks off. And then there's another part where, you know, he may be out cruising looking for another one and he hears a buck do this to another smaller buck, like a three-year-old doing it to a two-year-old. And this buck will overhear that and he'll go in there and be like, oh, I'm going to go kick both their butts. So this is one of the most deadly techniques. And another, another little tactic is, um, uh, well, a question that you would probably have, Doug, right, would be, um, when do you do it, right? 
do you have to see a buck in a field? Like, cause you're, you're the captain of like seeing a, a big deer off in the distance and going like, what could I have done? Right. Like you like, should I have grunted? Should I rattle? Should I stayed quiet? Like, I think that's, I don't think there's a right answer, but I think knowing what you can do is one where you're like, okay, well, First off, one of the greatest tips I've ever heard, and I think it was when I first started to use calling like with my mouth, like, you know, snort wheezing or grunting or whatever. Uh, I watched Don Kiske back on Extreme Whitetails. That tells you how how much of a, a TV geek I am of back in the day. Extreme Whitetails. I watched Don Kiske in Iowa hunting in a big oak um, in a cedar thicket. This is back when... Uh, when Don and Candy and everybody would get into the woods in Iowa. Now they just, everybody puts the food on the outside and you get in the blind and I get it. I'm getting older. I, I get it. But I really loved extreme white If you guys are DVD and VHS nuts, you can need to look for the, the first extreme white tail videos. I think miles Keller was on there. Um, big white tail died. Don Kitsky. Uh, proved a point where he was watching this really big whitetail, big heavy deer, I think, real tall, kind of wrapped around, and and he was real tight. And this buck walked to this ridge, and he was walking the ridge, and Don knew he could call to this buck in the middle of this rut, and this buck would come. But he said, if I call to this deer right now, this deer is really close to the edge of our scent cone, and if this if I was to call to this buck, this buck's immediately going to cut downwind and come in. He's going to smell us. He's going to be gone. So Don Kitsky, I remember this. And Don is literally, there's a lot of phonies out there. There's a lot of crazy people in the outdoor industry, and I'm not going to bash any of them right now. We'll save that for later. But Don Kitsky is, to me, one of the salt of the earth, whitetail killing, whitetail freaks, that I've ever met, and he's always been incredible. Uh, and I've learned stuff just through listening and watching this. So he watches this buck walk on this ridge, and he said, I can't call to it. I'm, 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 hopefully he comes back. And a little bit later, this buck comes back across this ridge, and now this time he's going to go upwind of Don. And he waits for that deer to get upwind of him. Now, why am I telling this story? Let's recap. I'm telling this story to tell you when to do this. Don't call it that buck if he's going to circle downwind of you because he's going to try to circle anyways. So wait for that deer to be upwind of you or quarter upwind of you, right? So that he's kind of got to come toward you and he's got to really work probably coming in bow range to get downwind of you. So he's up. So Don waits for him to get upwind and he gives him a, this buck turns on a dime, comes right out of me, kills him. I, I literally think he has to get around the tree and shoots this deer like 10 yards because he pinpointed that that noise. So for me, that was always the number one tactic when calling at a deer is to make sure that that deer is, let's say, ha out to the side, let's say 90 degrees or in front of you to your upwind side before calling at him. And what's the rule number one that you write down in your book, Dougie? Call when he's looking. Don't do not call when he is looking at you. Period. He will pinpoint and he will bust you. Um, if you have to, I mean, you could maybe. I mean, if you had, if if you were all camouflaged up and you were tight and you could throw that call maybe behind you a little bit, like you know, anytime I'm calling, anyways, I'm kind of if that buck's out in front of me, I'll kind of just turn my head a little bit and try to call it behind me that tree. You know, kind of throw it that way like you're you're trying you're trying to to throw that call just a little bit away from you especially if you can throw it upwind right so anyways those are kind of what what's going on in the deer woods and what we should be doing right now um we talked we talked about the snort wheeze i got a little things wrote down here to, dougie's just helped me kind of keep track and there's so many things i want to tell y'all um we're looking at decoying right now, boys and girls. With what I saw tonight, that that buck came 300 yards of those two little dudes fighting, why would he do that? Like, he's committing suicide if it was anybody but me in that tree. Um, 
So this is the time when you're going to use a buck decoy. You're not going to use those doe decoys because the does I saw tonight, these does were, you know, a hundred yards away, skirting down the edge of this little grass thing and getting out of dodge because I think they're just getting harassed by these bucks because we've had, I wouldn't say cool temperatures, but we have had, um, what do you got over there? I was curious, do you put one antler on or two antlers? Ooh, one antler or two. Well, let me get into buck decoys over doe decoys, and then I can kind of tell you some of the things that I've experimented with. So if you know me, right, you know that I've probably experimented with every decoy out there. I remember Delta made a real light one that you could pack the, the head and the legs in, and I think they called them Bucky Jr. I think Stan Potts used one of them on the HS. Give me a second. Come on, guys. He just put a muzzy right through his chest. Old Stan, I don't know which way you're looking, but you're carrying a Delta uh, Bucky Jr. across the field. Always put the buck decoy out. I, I have the greatest decoy of all time. Her name is Doe Fonda. Doe Fonda is in the garage right now. We have to get Doe Fonda out in the next couple of days. We got to get her all sent free and and uh, we'll probably scare the UPS man on the front porch, but she's going to be sitting out front getting uh, all acclimated to the weather and all of her scent off of her. But she is a mounted doe, bedded doe decoy, and she is fired during the rut in a food plot, I'm telling you right now. But if I'm hunting with a decoy, 90% of the time, 90% of the time we're looking at a buck decoy, we're going to look directly upwind of our stand. Normally for me, I'm going to put it not too close. I'm going to want that nice 20 yard shot. I'm going to put that decoy quartering at my tree, right? Not facing directly at my tree because you really don't want a deer or a decoy or, you know, to them as a deer, you don't want that deer staring at the location where the predator is or the hunter, right? So you just kind of quarter it at you a little bit right um there's many good decoys out there i personally use a dave smith dsd decoy they are hands down the most incredible whitetail decoy out there I, I know you can't really get your hands on them so if you find them you better buy them up they're super expensive they're super worth it you get what you pay for dave smith decoy dsd I use their turkey decoys, I use their deer decoys, and have been using them for decades. Uh, they have a new doe decoy out. I'm going to have to sell my kidney to get one of them bad boys. But if I had that buck and that doe and I had doe fonda laying there, I would just use a whole herd of deer decoys. We have every buck in that field on us, but uh, DSD decoy. I, I think uh, Flambeau makes a big a big, big decoy, but I really find a problem with how you stake them down. I've seen people use 3D targets as well. Really, you got to, you know, you could do an experiment. You could put a giant red beach ball in the middle of a field and deer, that's what we're talking about, mature deer and regular deer. They're going to be curious enough to come find out what that new thing is in the field, right? So we're not going after curiosity. We're going after trying to uh, trying to get a fight going. We're trying to um, play on the dominant side of what these bucks are going through and what their emotions are and what their testosterone and they're they're trying to they're trying to scrape on every tree and pee on every tree and and they're trying to kind of get their little zones and they're just showing how you know big and mean they are. So right now a buck decoy quartered at you at sixteen to twenty yards because remember when you when you see a buck and he sees your decoy he's going to stare in the same direction as that decoy is looking and then when he comes in he's going to circle downwind of wherever that wind is blowing so you have to it is crucial to make sure that that buck decoy is upwind of you and you have to make sure that you can shoot on both sides of them that you have windows because there's been a lot of times where i've crept out put up the decoy got back in the stand and I've realized that I can't shoot on the left-hand side of where this buck decoy is. And I know if that buck comes in, he's going to circle downwind of it. And I have to shoot that deer before he gets that wind of that decoy. Because I really haven't had a lot of luck with being able to destroy all the scent, whether I use the sodium benzenol that's in 
all of your sprays, your sent away sprays and all this stuff, um, you really can't beat that scent that's on that decoy. The best way that I've found to do it is to spray it down with a, a scent killer and then be able to keep it out into the yard or keep it out. You can, I've, I've put it in hay before or leaves that I've raked up and just to get it smelling like outside, but I've still never been able to beat the nose of that whitetail. When that whitetail comes downwind, he will immediately freak out. Um, so put that buck at you. Two antlers or one. Man, I really have found that it doesn't matter if you use giant antlers, uh, medium-sized antlers, or one antler. I have really found that none of those matter. It is incredible to watch a buck enter a field, look over, see a decoy. Remember, you let them look away and you give them a little, or you give them a little... And that, let's say that deer head starts heading your direction. He's going to posture up. He's not going to be a paying attention. He's going to have his head cocked and he's going to be walking in and he's going to give you one of those quarter and, you know, one of those quarter and shots because he's trying to get his face sideways to strike that buck from the side. He's not going to hit him head on. He's going to hit him from the side because he's going to try to blindside him. Right. And just normally if you're pointing that decoy kind of at the, at the tree stand or the blind, that buck's going to go ahead and give you a quarter, you know, a qu uh, quartering away or a broadside shot. And that's, that's money. And so, but remember, I'm going to tell you right now that if that deer gives you that opportunity, kill him as soon as you can get him in there and broadside. Don't play around and go, let's see what he does. Let's see if he goes ahead and strikes this decoy like they do on the television and then let's shoot him. That dude is going to smell where you stepped. That dude is going to smell that decoy and he's going to trip out. And once he comes in, like you, when you decide you're going to shoot him, just put one in him. You can try to stop him. But the best thing is just to go ahead and pick a spot and get it in the middle of his body, get it into his lung and you, you catch yourself a buck, right? So just don't play around. If you decide you're going to shoot that deer, get a broadside and kill him. Did that answer your question? Yeah. I really love decoy. Like once you get, once you get addicted to decoying, you'll shoot uh you'll see you'll shoot a subpar buck because of the experience with the decoy and with the with with everything that went on. And you can really fire up your life or your hunting life by, you know, setting goals for yourself. Like I've never killed one over a decoy. I'm gonna start hunting with one for the next two weeks. Every time I go out, I'm going to hunt with a decoy. You're going to get a whole different experience, a whole different correlation between an animal and nature, and then this object that you're taking out to fool them. So if you're looking away to kick up your game, let's say you're depressed that you just don't have any big deer on your farm that score 200 inches like Don Higgins lacks, uh, but you've got a bunch of just nice deer in a, in a year that there's eight and nine pointers that are big mature whitetails. Do decoy one and watch your blood pressure and your adrenaline and your smile light up and uh, and just challenge yourself to, to decoy one and watch what these does do. These does are going to freak out. So the first time you use one and the does come into the field and they look and they see the buck decoy, they're going to lose their minds. Like they're going to freak out. They're going to freak out like my wife going in the other room and finding out I shaved my beard in the sink. Okay, she's going, they're going to freak out when they see these buck decoys because they don't move. They'll stomp at them, they'll stomp at them. Just chill. Just chill. Nature will take care of itself. As long as they don't smell them and as long as they don't see you, you're money. You're golden. Just let everything unfold. Um, Dougie, what about this weatherman? I know that on episode two, I told you guys that this amazing cold front was coming through with snow accumulation. And Thursday night on the full moon was going to be not only this giant temperature drop, but also this extreme cold front. Well, the weatherman was wrong, and that's okay because it doesn't matter to me how cold the cold front is. I still know what that moon's going to do, and I still know that these bucks want to cruise, and they're on missions, and they're, when I say cruise, let me back that up. The rut's not happening if you saw little bucks 
shoving their face up the rear end of a doe. It's not happening. Yes, 2% of the white-tailed does in America are getting bred by bucks. I get that. But they're not into a big frenzy. They're not worked up. They're not worked up into that bell curve that people talked about. They're not into that crazy time when everybody's like, the rut, the rut's on, the rut's on. No, the checking to see if girls will let you party, that's what's really on. And so you're, you've got the full moon coming on Thursday, the 28th. You've got the 27th, which is 48 hours and 24 before the full moon. And you have a... What I, what I would refer to as a kind of a pre-rut before the does are into heat, establish, establishing dominance scenario where these bucks are, they, they really feel the need to go just be, just they, they just need to be bad boys. They just need to go out and fight and dominate and go from farm to farm and check all this stuff. And if they have cool enough weather, and I'm talking 50 degrees, if they have cool enough 50 degrees, 60 degrees with, you know, uh, this humidity in the air where they can really, they can, they can lip curl and they can, they can kind of smell these does and they can kind of taste the air. It's just going to get them worked up. They're going to walk. They're going to walk down these fence lines. They're going to hit these scrapes. Wherever you had scrapes last year, go get these cameras on these scrapes. These boys are going to walk the 27th, 28th. I would take off. I would hunt in the morning. I would hunt in the evening. I would break my own rule of not hunting in October in the morning. I would get in there early. I would sit. These bucks are going to walk, and they're going to walk the timber, and they're going to check these little scrapes. They're going to do this. It is going to be the best odds you have that as humans, as humans looking at the the, the things that we have in front of us, a full moon has made sailfish and all these ocean fish all the old time fishermen have used the 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 day of the full moon the they have been doing this for years this is not new science i'm not a genius uh, i'm just a, a deer nut uh, and i i've watched and killed some giant deer on the days of full moons i've watched them do really stupid stuff and here's how i can explain a full moon if you're in an area and these bucks are hitting and these these bucks are moving at night through your spots in those spots. Those bucks are going to do that in the daytime in a four to six hour period of time. They're going to walk these trails. They're going to do what deer are supposed to do, but they're going to do it in a block of time somewhere in that 24 hour period before the full moon of the 28th or even the day before. And they're just going to do it for four or five hours and they're going to walk and you're going to catch them on camera and you're going to go, man, I wish I was there. I'm trying to tell you just to be there. It happens. It happens every year, two or three times a hunting season. And uh, and it's real. It's real. You look at the Red Moon Guide. You look at some of this other stuff that gets really into it. I'm just telling you that if you're going to hunt a day, hunt the 28th. Be there early in the morning. Sit all day. Enjoy a nice 60-degree day in Illinois. It's going to be It's going to be warm. The cold front's coming what? Tuesday, Dougie, Wednesday, it's going to get down to our first freeze in Illinois, like hard freeze. Yeah. Yeah, so you're looking at Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, cold stuff. We're going to get down into freezing. You're going to get your first hard frost, Midwest. You're going to get it. You're going to get it. You're going to turn some of these these crop, these, these, the woods that are green, everything that's green, going to get zapped. And we're supposed to get a ton of rain right after that. Just a t absolute six, seven days of rain. Now, I don't believe the weatherman. So I'm going to believe about 40% of what he says. But if we get 40% of the rain that they're calling for, what a great time to do one big reset on all your whitetail property. I'm going to talk about this. And, you know, I want to talk about this. And then we're going to get go ahead and get off here. Now, Dougie and myself have been setting the buck decoys out. Dougie just got a new, really fast setup kind of stand. Lone Wolf, right? Like you got Lone Wolf? It used to be right here out of Peoria. Uh, DeQuistow. He, he was the man, dude. He taught me so many big buck things. 
Andre DeQuisto. He's still one of the gangsterous big buck killers on the planet. Shout out to him. I follow his son too on, uh, he's never messaged me back on Instagram, uh, dying breed hunter, uh, shout out to them, their podcast. They do a lot of cool stuff. Um, I've been a, a fan of Andres for a long time. We've been friends. I haven't talked to him in 15 or 20 years, but he's the man. He still is. He was t- teaching me stuff in Cass County when he was teaching Ben Platner and myself of bumping deer in October and then hanging right above them and getting in there next morning and killing them uh, in early October. Just gangster, just just gangster OG deer stuff, big buck stuff. Um if somebody's going to kill a new world record in Illinois and it, and Andre's still doing his thing, I always thought that he'd be killing a 200 and something inch typical because that was what he was after. Uh, but what we're talking about right now is your tips and tricks. Uh, Dougie has it wrote down tips and tricks, your wet weather um, that we're, that's coming for like four or five days. So what we have planned right now, one of my best friends, Kirk's coming in town. We've got all of our properties ready to go. Dougie's got his spots. I got a couple other buddies and we are going to try to invade these areas. We're going to make some new mock scrapes and you're like, well, you're going to make mock scrapes. They're already hitting them. It's already November. Listen, cool down, relax. I'm going to explain. The fact is, is that you have certain things in the deer season and in your year and in your life that happen and they literally negate everything that's going on and they muddy the water. So picture when I was with Zach Brown and we were doing a show and we were talking about things, he probably had the best explanation and euphemism I've ever seen. When I was explaining to him how we go in and set stands and, and when we invade a property and we do something in a couple of days, he was like, so you're telling me you go in and muddy the water and then you wait until the, the water gets clear again. When that water gets clear again, everything's back to normal. So what I'm trying to tell you is this rain is coming. The crops are coming out as fast as the farmers can pick and combine right now. I say pick, farmers freak out and go, well, we use a combine, we don't pick it. Okay, Royce. So they're picking, they're combining as fast as they can right now. Deer are getting pushed all over from their summer ranges, from their ditches they've been in. They got giant combines pushing in. My buddy Royce up north in northern Illinois had a buck in a soybean field that literally would run 30, 40, 50 yards and bed down with his head down in the soybeans. You couldn't see him. Now, this is a 130-inch deer. That deer would jump and go 50, 100 yards away and bed down again. He didn't want to leave that soybean field. Well, well, when Royce got done com- combining all the soybeans, that deer had to go to the timber. Otherwise, he was out in the wide open. This is happening all over the Midwest right now. Right now, this is all happening. Deer are recalibrating themselves. Deer are moving from one woodlot to the other, checking on which doe. Hey, hey, Teresa, you're going to be down to hook up later like they're literally checking these does and they're going to remember who's going to be ready who's who's coming into season first they these more mature deer they've been around they've been around the block okay they're doing what i call a little bar crawl right now they're moving around getting to know who the big dudes are on the block that they're going to have to fight they're trying to figure out where the best uh, food is and we're really not food i sh- i shouldn't even say that they're not even they don't give a crap about food. They're going to lose 30 or 40 pounds in the next, I don't know, let's say three, four weeks. I've already watched these bucks lose uh, poundage, LBs. Um, I had a big deer show up right here at the farm today, uh, a deer we've been waiting to show up. We knew it was going to be any day. I went with the wife the other day and was sitting and just watching uh, the field. And, because I'm, and she's like, what buck are we hunting? And I'm like, I don't know. We're just here because sooner or later with all these deer, one of these big matures is going to roll out here. He's going to roll out at 20 yards. We're going to kill him, and he's going to be a booner. Does he live here? No. Is he coming here? Yeah. Is he always going to be here? Absolutely not. He's going to come through. He's going to wreck my trees, uh, uh, all the scrape trees that we have going, and he's going to rip everything up, and he's going to recalibrate his life. He's going to either set up shop or he's going to set up to where this is a transition area. This is the time to go just enjoy the weather. Don't look at all the craziness. Just go enjoy your life and sit out there and remember to give them an old practice it tomorrow.
practice it in the truck while you're at work, whatever you got to do on your way to work. Hopefully you're listening to this podcast, but the, the, to get to the real tip is recalibrate everything in the wet weather. We have our stands, we have our safety harnesses, we have our, um, what do they call those? The lineman rope, the safety ropes that go all the way up. We have our bow ropes, we have our sticks, stands, blinds, uh, everything that we're going to take and put into the woods, we have out in outside getting descented. And, and if I can't get the China, it comes from China. When I can't get the China smell off of all the stuff, all the stands, because that's where they're all built, right? Maybe Vietnam, maybe whatever, whatever. It's a joke. Lighten up. Uh, all the stuff, all the smell, all the factory smell. We got them outside right now. We're running them through the dirt. We're, we're letting them, you know, descent. We're trying to get them a little acclimated. If you go out to the, if you go out to the, think about this, you go to Menards, you buy a ladder stand, you put it all together and you put it right into the woods and you just put it right in his bedroom, man, you just did yourself such a disservice. So the best thing you can do is get all these parts, get all these stands run it through the mud, do whatever you have to, to get the scent and the oils and all the stuff off. Cause you're just going to take this bow rope. You're going to take this safety rope. You're going to take all this stuff, all these straps, all these ratchet straps, just take your ratchet straps, man, throw them in some sodium benzenol, some scent killer or some, you know, uh, baking, baking powder, uh, baking soda, uh, throw them in some water with some of that. Get the scent off of it before you take them in the woods, do yourself a favor. You've, you've, You've either owned the property or done so much work. You've put all your dreams into this. Don't let all this scent go in there and be this giant scent wick. Because if you're my neighbor and and you're doing all this, those deer are going to come to a place either that I'm I'm using these precautions and I'm and I'm going to go invade while it's pouring down rain. We're going to go put up these stands. We're going to go doctor up some of these scrapes and I'm going to use mother nature. I'm going to use the downpour of water and the reset, the muddying of the mud puddle. I'm going to use this under the cover of everything to go set cameras and do all the stuff I have to do right here before the rut. This is coming the first little bit of November. Take your bow with you. You never know what'll happen. But if you go out there, this is the time that if you have these last minute tweaks that you have to do, wait till it's pouring down rain or you're in between rains or whatever and go just get it done and get out of there. That is the best tip that I can tell you that you're getting, you're getting a gift, whether this hot stuff that's coming or whatever, it's bringing weather, you're getting a gift, go out there, make these last minute tweaks, all this stuff. You know where these big deer were last year. If they're still alive, they're going to do it 365 days later almost to the hour, almost to the day. They're going to be in these same spots. Get those cameras up. You're getting ready to be in a time that if you, if you can get away and you can get to the woods, play that wind, but you better be the trail camera. Up until now, you've used trail cameras to give you all this intel. You've used all these trail cameras to tell you what's out there and give you all this stuff. You're going to hit Halloween, and right after Halloween, you've got... November 1 and 2 and 3 and 4, those are some of my favorite four days on the planet. And then you kind of go into this lockdown phase where you can get lucky. This buck's getting off this dough. Every year's a little different. And then my next favorite day is November 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th, and 11th. Most of the Pope and Young Whitetails at one time in the, in the world, and I remember the statistic, were killed on Veterans Day, November 11th, because everybody was in the woods. So... If I had to pick a time to go to another state, because I, I know guys right now, they're hunting Illinois, hunting all over at Outfitters, and they're like, I'm just having a really horrible time. I think this is my first and last time with an Outfitter. Listen, the Outfitters aren't magic. We're not killing big deer right now. If you're going to come hunt a different state, especially a state like Illinois, you better be picking the second or even third week of November, because you have to realize that yes, half the deer are dead, but these big deer starting November one, two, three, normally about the third or fourth, really for me in my farms and d different farms are different. The third and the fourth, they will lock with these does and I will see two and three and sometimes four year old deer everywhere. 
but I really don't see the big giant matures until about the eighth. They get off these first does and then they're running around looking for the second one and you can kill them. So that's my, uh, that's kind of my tip for everything. Dougie, you got anything else? We're at the 50 something minute mark. Not really. It's party time, man. Yeah, it is. It is go time. It is big buck. This is what we've been waiting for. You guys don't take it so serious. I'm speaking to myself here too. You know, the, the Lord's in this, the, the Lord is in everything that you do. Make it about him. Make it a glorifying God. Now, as I say that, remember that the number one thing with controlling these areas of these big bucks is, you know, sometimes you just can't, you can do all the precautions. You can put up all the signs. You can bust all the trespassers. You can, you can leave your farm alone, but a lot of times you can't help somebody trespassing somebody riding a side by side because they're on a joy ride. Cause it's a nice 70 degree day on November 1st. Um, you can't help the farmer tilling or under the, the soil. All I can tell you, to, all, all I can tell you is, is that with each one of those big downfalls that you have, we just had a big trespasser mess up a big deer and that we've been leaving an area alone. And the only thing I can think of is there's gotta be a reason for it. We're going to persevere. It's, it's not as big a deal as it could be. You, you set a plan, somebody messed it up. You've been dealing with that since your sister, uh, broke your skateboard when you were a little kid. Listen, adversity brings out the best. I got my friend Doug here. Uh, old Dougie Fresh, I really appreciate you being here, just confident going through this. You've heard me talk on uh, on episode one, episode two, about how hard it is for men to, you know, men need men. They need to act like men. They need to have iron sharpening iron. It talks about that in the good book. It talks about that in the gospel. Again, if you guys need help, out there with uh, being men and you want to reach out, reach out to me. I've got a support team like Doug uh, and and Kirk and these other guys that'll be happy to reach back out to you, man. We want to tell you about the gospel. We want to talk about, talk about how, you know, men suffer in silence. It's a big deal. Um, you know, it, it, men and women are different. Marriage is hard. Uh, being skinny is hard. Having a six pack is hard. Uh, working out is hard. Being fat is hard. Being out of shape is hard. You know, we all have different hearts. You just got to kind of pick what you're willing to to do. Uh, we're not getting out of this. Uh, we're not getting out of this uh, life without the the stresses and without the the trials. And that's what this life is. the The harder you go for Christ and the the uh, the blood of Jesus Christ that gave you, um, you know, life. This is not our home, and all knees. All knees will bow. Uh, Acts twenty twenty four is my favorite part of any book um, in the Bible, and it just talks about finishing the race to the glory of God and the and and the good Lord and Jesus Christ. And really, what that is to me is that this is truly a different season. This whole podcast adventure, this journey, men coming together, people that have reached out that said, hey, listen, keep telling me about deer. Keep telling me about the good news of Jesus. And uh, go take your wife and go out and see the blind, Phil Robertson's story. It's a story about redemption. I think a lot of people can relate. Uh, I really wish they would show the other stuff about, uh, you know, how much easier it is to eat the crap sandwich knowing that this isn't our home. Um and I think, you know, that's the part of love and that men really don't know how to express. And we do suffer silently because our women, we, we're supposed to take care of them. And uh, a lot of us are alone, even though we're with other people and everybody is bearing a cross. And most of the people that are going through loneliness, um, yeah, dude, we're lonely. Like, I'm lonely. I think other people are lonely um, and our lives are getting so fast. It's okay to say that you are lonely. It's okay to say that you are a sinner. It's okay to, you know, be, a sh you know, it's okay to be ashamed, right? Like we're all ashamed of the things we've done. We're all ashamed of, you know, who we are or what we've said or our actions or, or these sinful natures that are born in us as humans. Um, but realize that no matter how ashamed you are of all of that, don't let that hang up from hitting your knees and talking to Christ.
you know, talking to God, uh, reach out to Yahweh. Uh, he's our creator. And then the son, uh, Jesus Christ and the gospel. It doesn't matter what denomination. That's not the question. It's a relationship. The guy on the right hand of, uh, you know, you had two guys on the crosses when Jesus Christ was crucifixed or, uh, you know, on the cross in crucifixion and was dying. Uh, one of them is in hell right now, and the other one just said, I'll follow you, Jesus. And can you imagine when that guy got to heaven? And they're like, what are you doing here? And you're like, well, that guy, that guy said I, I could come just because he loved Jesus. He wasn't he wasn't at the... Uh, he wasn't asked at Sunday night mass, or he wasn't uh, taking communion. He wasn't uh, at a denominational Christian church. He didn't, you know, all these acts and works and all this stuff. Listen, he's there to listen. Jesus is real. He lived on this earth. He died for our sins and God our creator. Um, when Don't be fooled by social media and things that are out there talking about God. Uh, there's a lot of people that refer to God in a lot of these clips and a lot of this stuff, but there's only one way to, and to the Father, and that's through Jesus Christ and His blood. Love you all. I'm Chris Brackett. Big shout out to Herman Brothers uh, Fisheries, Herman Brothers Realty for making this happen. Uh, Bordeaux Brothers out there in Vermont, uh, New York, Maine. Um, yeah, uh, appreciate you. This is episode three. We're going to bring you more this week. This week's going to be fire. We're, we might film every single day or at least every other day with an update of what's going on. We're really looking forward to deer camp and the deer reports in uh, 2023 season. This is going to be fire, y'all. Thanks. Chris Brackett, I'm out.